<laughs> I'm a moron. <laughs> this is, I mean, how many have we done? And I haven't done this before. I'm like, oh my God, how do I add a panelist? Um, so hi, Sarah. Hello, darling. Hello. Lovely. How are you? Good. Really good. Thank you. I was a bit like, oh my God, how do I get in? But anyway, I'm here. All good. Yes, so I've I've filled and done some tap dancing, a little bit of contemporary dance to keep everybody well done. Doing whilst I frantically tried to fix this. Um, so listen, thank you so much for joining. It's oh, pleasure. Just oh, asking it's me. Just a dead privilege. Like you're you're beyond epic, and she knows it's really embarrassing for Sarah, but I am a bit fine girl. Um, so I'll try not to lick the screen, and um, on with the show. So. As we know, this is about hospitality in 2021, but I did say earlier that I think it's a really good idea as you're such a brilliant investor that we talk about expectations on the investor side. You know, if you're yeah. setting a small business, um, what are some things that you would look for? So without further ado, um, I am going to start. So Sarah, this obviously uh, 2020, I don't think we need to talk about it <laughs> anymore because it really is, has been a, you know, bit of a nightmare for everyone and particularly hospitality but just a bit about you to begin with before we go into the industry as a whole um you know you are one of Europe's most prominent entrepreneurs and investors I wouldn't say Europe but well, you know, I mean you're no, you're, Stoke, I, Stoke on Trent's most, Stoke on most, Trent's prominent, most investor. prominent yeah yeah investor. <laughs> absolutely um but you've had a really exciting beginning of the year haven't you we just, have actually yeah, yeah um yeah, so I mean, like everybody else, uh, this time last year, I was, you know, sat on the floor sobbing, thinking, "What does my future look like? Is this everything I've all always worked for, and uh, just about to disappear?" And um, you know, like everybody, was very concerned, worried for the future, didn't know what it was going to look like. So much of my um, life has been spent in hospitality. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's my, it's, it's part of my soul is in that industry. Oh, yeah. I love it so much. I was very concerned. And at that time, we, you know, this time last year, we didn't actually have a route out. We didn't know what the world was going to look like. Um, and I guess as, I guess as the months progressed, just like with everybody else, we started to see as we, we opened up again, July the 4th yeah. it was, um, we're like, okay, people do still want to go out to drink. Um, you know <laughs> yes what they do <laughs> there is hope um, and of course the restrictions and um, you know you have to, people were starting to look at restructuring their businesses but what became eminently very clear to me was that this wasn't a PL problem this is actually a balance sheet problem so okay. as the year progressed I think that balance sheet problem became more and more obvious and when you say balance sheet you're talking about cash and you know debt leveraging and everything totally like it became much more about how the business is structured how it's been yeah. set up um, the amount of leverage borrowing that businesses had had to take on from the banks because whilst that support was there it's still borrowing I mean and it has to get paid back borrowing. is it affordable yeah, right yeah exactly um but actually on a on a day-by-day -day basis even with the restrictions what I mean by the P&L side of it was that you know you were still getting money in through the front door mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that most operators did was actually start to really really cut back in a way that I don't sure. think any of us have gone through our ins and outs you know our profit and loss in the way that we did at the beginning of the the initial um lockdown and is this pre-furlough as well this is all pre well sort of pre-furlough and then it comes into furlough yeah. and then you're starting to work out okay right i i see what has to be done here so fast forward a little bit it gets it's towards the end of the summer and one of my investments is the London Cocktail Club business that I've been there since you know the first brick on the ground loved it and we'd actually we were actually business that had been up for sale pre-COVID okay. um not and <laughs> would you believe I actually had an offer in for the business the day we shut all 10 bars and we couldn't write it I, I it's like literally one of the worst days of my life oh my god and I sit down at the end of the day this thing comes into my inbox saying oh yeah we'd also quite like to see uh, how you're coping with the um the recent news of the coronavirus and I'm like we just shot oh my all god. 10 bars yeah. anyway so um fast forward a little bit and we get to the end of the summer and I sat down talking to my husband and said he said what are we going to do with London Cocktail Club um 
And I said, you know what? I actually think that next year we're going to have this opportunity uh, if we're well invested, we've got the cash. So i.e. our sure. balance sheet, it looks good. Yeah. Uh, this opportunity that I will never have seen before in my, my whole career, I think the, the opportunity is going to be um, unprecedented demand. Mm -hmm. At this point, I didn't think for a second we'd be in another lockdown, by the way, Very at the quite. beginning of the year. But I think <laughs> no, any of us does. <laughs> no, the demand will be there. Um, I think the property um, horizon, the, the yeah. property market would be very different than I've ever seen before, which would be more available sites due to lack of com competition. But also most businesses that will come out of this well actually won't have the capital to grow because of what we've just talked about taking sure. the mission. It's, it's going to have to be a really tight ship for some exactly. Because exactly. Of um, and that, and also businesses, there will be, we're not the only ones that are going to be sat here having this conversation. And in fact, the longer this goes on for, the more you're going to find that founders, so the operators will be underwater in their equity uh, because of, it might be because of uh, preference share structures with private equity. It might be because actually the senior debt from the banks is so high now with the yeah. C-bills that effectively the banks run the businesses, but it'll all be balance sheet problems yeah so um we sat there at the end of the summer and said you know what we could do what we did this is something we did 15 years ago we could set up effectively a cash shell mm -hmm. uh and float it on aim and buy up some of these businesses so that we offer a home for that restructuring that businesses that are fundamentally sound yeah wrong with them they've just in order to survive had to restructure their balance sheet into such a way that actually the people who are operating it now no longer have any skin in, left in the game and there's nothing worse than a business being run with people that aren't in, aren't incentivized that aren't no, motivated that aren't driven and that's what we did so this is a very long answer to your very short question <laughs> like i started the year um we then set about we made some phone calls in september and we managed on the 12th of january to simultaneously IPO and acquire the London Cocktail Club as our first strand That's and IPOs, IPO'd, raised four million. Um, and actually the, it's been incredibly successful. I think we must have just got our timing right. And, you know, at that point of us coming up with the idea, there was no sign of a vaccine, there was nothing. Also no sign of the first quarter of 2021 being another blimmin lockdown, I have to say. So we had not anticipated raising money Relentless. halfway through the fundraise. Uh, it, it was announced, one was announced that we were going to have a tier, the tier four was going to be part of the tier structure. And then by the end of our fundraise, the beginning of December, there was a national lockdown announced. So I mean, everything that went wrong could have got, gone wrong, but we did drag it kicking and screaming over the line. So yeah, yeah it was, you know, you know, I'm glad to be sat here yeah. in a position now to be able to talk to lots of those businesses, um, well-funded and to say, look, you know, we are a sensible home. Come and yeah. come and talk to us about growing your business as you always dreamt you were going to in 2000. 21 with, with a significant amount of expertise on the board as well um so okay so if we look ahead to 2021 and we think about our you know the audience today who are going to be a mixture of accountants who are looking after hospitality clients and uh, maybe just lots of people who are interested but equally hospitality vendors as well typically on the sm you know small business um side of things what would you say are the absolute essentials in hospitality that owners and managers need to be drilling into on a daily weekly monthly basis so I think one of the, um, you know, I think last year, certainly sort of August, September, um, the demand that we saw, albeit for a very short period of time, so it by no means weighed up, um, the, you know, the losses during the course of the year, um, but the demand that we saw was unexpected. So I think now we, we have to go into this summer assuming demand that we've never seen before. Yeah. There's that and then the VAT. So the VAT is really, really important. The 5% VAT versus 20% VAT. That 5% VAT is, you know, whether it's for an event, tickets, food, you know, look at ways to, two things. One, look at ways that you can absolutely maximize that VAT because it is worth a lot, a lot of money and not to be underestimated. So find ways of, of, of making sure, you know, speak to your accountants. If you're an accountant, 
read the detail and find the best way for your clients to be able to maximize that, yeah. uh, which is more cash. And the second thing is don't leave a pound on the table. You know, this is your chance to be able to take as much money as you possibly can. If you obviously within the constraints of the, of the government that they set for us, but you put as many tables as you can, yeah. you speak to the council, you get to put your tables outside. If you can absolutely maximize your turnover. If you need to sell tables by the hour, sell tables by the hour, do whatever it takes to try and make up for some of the loss of last year. But if that demands there, don't leave a pound on the table. Love it. Um, forecasting, obviously had to ask about yes. forecasting. <laughs> um, so, so we were talking um, on, yeah. on Monday and, you know, last year you were saying that it was like forecasting just went out of the window because you just didn't know what was happening. But this year going forward, you know, what, how detailed do you think they should be? What essentials do you think, you know, they, there should be in there? How, sh what are you telling your companies to do or helping them with? Yeah, so we are forecasting now and I do think forecasting is really really important and I'll be completely honest it did go out of the window last year it was impossible mm -hmm. things were changing every three or four weeks sometimes every three or four hours we didn't know whether we were coming or going and within what environment we were working now I think now because of the success of the vaccine we have to at least plan mm -hmm. that what the government has told us is actually going to take place so the 17th yeah. of May 21st of June we have to plan for that and again, I think it is about sitting down and saying, right, back to almost what I was saying before, what could this demand look like? Yeah. How deep does the rabbit hole really go? Mm -hmm. How big could we be? Mm -hmm. And how do I absolutely maximize my sales? Do I need to spend more time, you know, in hospitality? Do you need to spend more more on looking at reservations do i need to change the structure in which i yeah. do reservations should i ditch reservations altogether should it just be walk through mm -hmm. you know so looking at that structure and then forecasting and saying right how do i staff for this because that's the, you know one of the biggest I mean, when I, when I when I had my pub back in the day, um, you know food and drink gps and wage percentage or you know the holy trinity of making money every day and you know dialing everything up yeah and i i also think one is i think consumer consumer perception or yeah consumer perception has changed slightly or consumer behavior as well we are booking more yeah um and i think there's a couple of things in that happened during the last year that are actually quite important one is that we all looked at our below the line we went through all of us went through our PLs and said right you know Without I question. absolutely maximize yeah, my absolutely. margins here yeah. so that my cash burn when I am locked down, when I'm closed, is at an absolute minimum. Absolutely. Bring those learnings through into your forecasting, bring them through into your operating now going into the summer. I think that's really, really important. And I've completely forgot what my next one was. <laughs> uh, but it will definitely come back to me because it was. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got to remember what it was now. Yes. Yeah, so I, and I, th I think in. In terms of it's one is the yes, that's the other thing I've remembered now. In terms of hospitality, customers, we got used to smaller menus, yeah, used to less choice. Very good for the stock it's control. Such and a great, exactly okay. as you've just said about when you had your pub and you think about your margins, you know, set yourself up now to absolutely maximize the amount of cash that you can yeah. make. You've got to make up. For last year um and the customers will not will not be angry because you've got fewer things on the menu god they're so happy to be out so on a practical level so if i'm thinking about creating a forecast now would you be advocating for you know get your margins set understand what what you are setting your target for those things so you've done your costings correctly and so on and so forth so really go through that in minute detail first but then on the customer, the footfall and actual, you know, the customer side of things, average spend, all of those things, would you be doing, right, let's do the gangbusters version where it does go mental, then let's go, okay, what happens if it's 50% lower? And are we still okay on the, in that balance sheet? Is everything still okay? Can we afford to do this? You know, and what are the variable factors? You know, if, 
if, if it's because of course it's the staffing levels you know are you making sure that headcounts going in line you know with the amount of for customers that you're forecasting yeah i mean look in any forecast you've got to have a level of sensitivity of course and um i you know the different scenarios and just comparing them you know as you're doing them totally so yeah. looking at you know for example labor is a semi-variable cost so there is a point at which you've yeah. got to break even exactly, exactly exactly on your side and, and that as an exercise in itself is so key something that i'm fortunate i didn't learn until about half of the way you know through yeah, and I, manual understanding that cash break even or um rather than a p l break even yeah. cash break even is is really critical within a business but I would be very surprised uh, if there are many hospitality businesses that have come out of 2020 without understanding their cash break even because your cash break even will have been literally the most important number that you will have looked at throughout the whole of last year is can I um, what do I need to take to stay afloat, you know, or at what point do I and stop? What, and what money? minimum staffing to actually just unlock the door? Totally. Customer. Which yeah. forms part of your, your, yeah. your break even. And I, I just think there will have been decisions that would have been made last year to lower that cash break even. Yeah. But it is understanding, again, what that's, you your, yeah. you know, that's your base starting point, but nobody's going to be breaking even this summer. You know, we are going to be flying this summer. And that's really important. So it is about going, right, you know, that's my base level. What was the best I did last year? Because everybody in hospitality will have had a week where they went, I do not believe it. it's like Christmas week, you know, in August, unprecedented. Yeah, and and, I, and as I say, you know, it obviously there's like only one of them rather, whereas in a normal <laughs> course of a year, we'd have maybe 15 of them. Yeah. Um, but you will have had a cracking week at some point. So use that week if you if you're not somebody that yeah. naturally sits there with a spreadsheet, use that week and go right. If that's the amount of sales that we do here, you know, did we manage? What was yeah. it like? Did the wheels fall off? Could we provide better customer service? Because in a situation this year, you need the repeat business. Yeah. Last year, frankly, you know, customers would come in; they'd be so grateful to come in because next week you couldn't go in again. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> so um, you know, but I, I would if forecasting is not something that I, I found, you know, that doesn't naturally fall within my comfort zone. I, I would, brilliant. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> play with the numbers and, yeah. and I, it doesn't have to be that detailed, to be no. honest, just understand the main the key drivers. Yeah. Without question. Yeah. And I think you've got, you know, a normal hospitality model, for example, or a good hospitality model will have um, sales, cost of sales, ideally no more than 25 percent mm -hmm. kind of ditto ish labor um and then you'd have your fixed costs which is your yeah. uh property your insurance that type of thing and then you'd have your variable costs which is like your cleaning products yeah. you want to be looking at um during these really busy periods you want to be looking at a minimum 20 25 percent cash margin at least, I mean, during your absolute flying moments, that's when you want to be making you 35 plus percent. Um, and that's whether you are food led, wet led, it's kind of easy, it's slightly easier in wet led actually. Yeah. Um, but food led, wet led, whatever you are, booze, drinks. Is the VAT, the VAT 5%, is that just on the food? It's is unfortunately it's on the food just on the food. Side. So that's, the, yeah. But it is also, let's say, for example, you have a live band mm -hmm. and you charge tickets for it, that type of thing. You can also look at as whether or not you can get a 5% on that. So okay. there are ways if you are heavily wet led, yeah. um, you know, it's bottomless projects, for example, are yeah. a huge thing at the moment where obviously the majority of stuff people are drinking Prosecco, but, you know, with some food in there some level of entertainment there's always ways of looking at um of trying just to maximize within the boundaries of hmrc but trying to maximize um that and your average spend yeah exactly um so so just just to pick up on what you said just earlier you would advocate that so what are your you know your costs should be 25 percent up to maximum what and and then wage percentages for he healthy you know a healthy business you'd say 25 percent and 25 percent I mean, that's 
it depends on it depends on your business model because some of them uh your labor will be lower than your cost sure. of sales and the other way around so um but your bottom line which is um your ebitda margin so that's before it's your cash margin basically yeah. so yeah. before amortization depreciation interest before all of that stuff so on yeah. your site alone you a normal year really want to be doing between 20 and 25 percent is what you should be looking for in a good hospitality business when you're flying so let's say for example first couple of weeks in September last year or end of August last year that's when you need to and say Christmas week yeah that's when you need to be bringing in your 35 percent EBITDA margin that is a really solid sustainable hospitality business nice Nice. And would you advocate for in a season with seasonal seasonal fluctuations, you know, we're going back to that break even uh, point for, you know, the minimum that it takes. If you find that, you know, on some days like Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, you're not making you're actually not covering your costs. Would you completely advocate for closing and being really restri restrictive and just making sure you're opening on the days that you know that you're going to make uh, Right. Yes. Yeah, so it's an interesting question in hospitality um, because it's not that simple. Um, so firstly, if you don't have hourly paid staff, right? So if you're if you have staff that you've got to you've got to pay them for 40 hours a week anyway, well. um, you know, you you might end up still having those costs, even though yeah. you shut. Clearly, your fixed costs are the same. Yeah. Your variable is not going to be that much different, to be honest. So actually, really, it's only your cost of sales margin, which is probably you know, 25%, let's say, of your turnover, your net turnover. So after after that, your net turnover. So it's a good question, but you've got to make sure that you always consider that actually quite a lot of those costs are kind of semi-fixed in the context of a week. So I and would... More on the food side of things then and just staffing the kitchen, you know, it's like, it's that kind of, if they're not salaried... Most of them are, I suppose. Yeah, a lot of them are salary, but I mean, a lot of them aren't, which is brilliant here in hospitality. A lot of them aren't, which is much better. Um, but I would look, I think the first thing I would do is look at my competition and I would say, are they full? Um, because if the demand is there for that Monday night and everybody else is full, then you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And you're either doing something wrong, it's either in your offer, it could be... Um, that you're not reaching your customers, that they don't know what's available on that particular day. So I think before I closed, I would ask myself, there you know, is there demand there, first of all? Because if there's demand, I would want to make sure that I can meet that demand before I closed. Uh, whereas, um, yeah, so I, I would look at my competition. I would look, I would look and see, okay, is there a reason that I'm not full on a Monday night? Because um my lights are on full blast and i haven't you know lit what is candles. exactly yeah um okay uh do you what do you think the biggest change in hospitality is going to be coming out of this pandemic oh that's a big question <laughs> big fat one there um, yeah <laughs> so sort of what on the ground level kind of like from the consumer perspective do you think um I, either actually because you know even from an ops perspective or you know or yeah the so side. i think the booking uh, the pre-booking is going to, is here to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think places that didn't do booking before um, are now doing bookings. And I think literally like selling a table for an hour or two hours. I mean, we wouldn't have done this a year ago. We would have no been you know, outraged. <laughs> you know, outraged. What do you mean? I've only got it for two hours. <laughs> you know, um, I think that's here to stay. Um, I also think a lot of people love the ordering at the table. You know, I think that's an yeah. efficiency actually yeah. within a within a restaurant yeah. is great, and I think people like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a significant change. Mm -hmm. I think flipping that over completely, sort of from an investor perspective, um, I think the big change is I think it's going to come in a lot of restructuring. So right. yeah. I think um, a lot of businesses will will have to certainly groups will have to operate very differently because sadly most people 
you know, we might have the most amazing summer in the world and the whole of the country will look at hospitality and go, I don't know what they complain about. Like, I can't get in to my local pub ever. Can't ever get a table anywhere. You know, they're clearly making loads of money. We have got so much to make up for from last year. Everybody has that we're really going to have to go some some this year to even come close to that. And therefore, businesses will not be able to grow as in multiply. I don't mean grow sales within a site. I mean, multiply yeah. in a way that they'd perhaps anticipated in doing. So I think there will be a big restructure. I think there will be private equity will change their model and will have to change their model. I think preference shares, we've proven now, all the people who've got normal, ordinary A shares are all under the water. And then you've got people with preference shares that are still going to get paid back on a sale. It kind of doesn't work somehow. So I think there will be a restructure within the industry, a, a sort of a, a larger level. I mean, equity should be equitable after all. And exactly. unfortunately, it's exactly. not. Um, okay. So just talking about, just, just going back a bit to the finance side of things, you know, do you, are, do you have a recommended finance, you know, process set up or finance function in your startups and small businesses you know is it technology plus an accountant is it outsourced do you train them you know what's the what's the leveling up in the financial education that you would expect from you know yeah, so I'm a bit of a data geek actually I love numbers and I love data and then trying to pull information out of that data um, but I understand that it's not everybody's default so I'm very careful not to go on and on and on about it when when for some people I'm, they're like I just can't do it mm -hmm. but I think there's one thing I can tell everybody that for certain um, no matter how much you hate those numbers you can tell everything that's going on in your business through those numbers yeah. so actually you could sit anywhere in the world and look at those numbers and you would know what has happened on that day within the site you would know whether there's be the types of things that are being sold you you can understand everything from those numbers as you multiply the the numbers become i mean you can't grow a business sure. without them but yeah people who've just got one site um they're so important to understand because without understanding your the margins you know, the margins for example that we've just talked about yeah without understanding those you don't know where to divert your you no know. yeah. and i do think one of the things that's really important is a lot of people don't know what good looks like mm -hmm. and i think you oh know my God. But particularly if you're an independent and you've got no one to rely you know you've got it's like where do you go to say okay what what should it be you know and i think you know accountants i i would i would love to see accountants educate themselves more within the context of an industry. Yeah. So it's very, you know, it's easy to come into a business as an accountant and do the numbers. But actually, if those numbers aren't structured in a way that helps that business to run itself better, you have not helped them. No. You basically ticked a box and got their statutory accounts in, done, easy. You've not actually, helped them to understand their business anymore and without understanding what good looks like and even better what great looks like we all love that like what does great look like having some level of benchmark against those numbers i think that's really important so where would you go for those then sarah i mean you know for the, the lay person in the street obviously you know from your years of experience but cool. you know i'm starting out where do i go to find out what good looks like yeah so it depends on the type of businesses how i would structure them um, and how big those businesses are. You know, some businesses just need a bookkeeper in with a, an accountant just to do the statutory accounts or because it depends on the experience of the founders. Um, that information is available around us. You know, there are people that know it. So it could be somebody that runs a couple of really good pubs that you might know down the road and yeah. say, what does it look like? You know, what should I be aiming for? What being scared, yeah. Um, Go and knock on a door. I can guarantee you at a time like this, they're all open. Everybody wants to help everybody. And then I think if you're going to work with an external accountant, choose them well. You know, ask their, ask the right questions. Do you know, just on that though, I mean, I've, you know, I was doing a thing with Barclays Eagle Labs the other day and, you know, a lot of the founders on the call 
we're saying we don't know what questions to ask. I think there's this, this um, disjointed relationship between the accountant and the SME often where, you, you know, your year end accounts have been presented. <laughs> Yeah, it's gone through tax preparation software, so it doesn't even look like your chart of accounts anymore. And then they ask you to sign it and you're like, well, you sign it, you've prepared it, you know, and and then if you're not getting any explanation, like you've just said, there's not been that help. How do you know how, you know, it's that empowerment to know what questions I should be asking, because, again, there's no driving test for setting up a business, is there? It's not no. a no. theory test, unfortunately. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, and I know all of this ends up costing money so i am aware of that and and it trying to keep costs as a minimum but i promise this would pay this will pay for itself is is as a small business having a set of management accounts and a set of monthly management accounts so you know this is just money coming in and money going out on a monthly basis it's That's not weird. structured it doesn't look like those hideous scary statutory accounts we don't none of us understand them you don't need to understand them just but the management accounts tell you the story of your business and learning to love them now i would say i'd be very surprised if one of the positive things that haven't come out of the last 12 months is that more people understand this yes what we're talking about than they ever have before people will have looked at their numbers yeah. Um, and just become comfortable it. with it. Yeah, they yeah. would have never done it before when they would have gone, yeah. what, we paid that? Re that's ridiculous. That's way too much. And actually have gone through, what, you know, I call it profit and loss accounts, but literally gone through like the stuff that's coming out of their bank yeah. and made those changes, which is really empowering. Absolutely. You your business at that level. Now, and it's keeping that going yeah. and just getting those regular management accounts so getting the regular numbers that help you to run the business i think are really really important and not all accountants will want want to do that to be able to do that so find one that can and does and that has other clients in your industry and so i'm assuming that you advocate for cloud and real time and you know using apis and getting the data you know so that humans don't need to touch it in off it you know totally oh yeah yeah totally and there's low yeah exactly exactly you know, get the get technology to do the heavy lifting for you. Do you would you always say that you know you still sometimes see the old till? I mean, most people are now on you know iZettle because yeah. of or whatever because of um, contactless. But you know, are there? Would you say that it's an essential to have a electric point of sale system? You know, when running it, just so that you can understand which feeds into I don't know your, your the the salary side of things and your headcount. I mean, obviously that makes life much easier, but you know, there are also people, you know, my mom's age who be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and so, yes, of course that makes it a lot easier and the software that's available, amazing. Um, and things just automatically go into a system. Once you've allocated where they go, they, yeah. can, they can continue to go into that system. Yeah. Um, so it does make it going forward. It is worth learning and understanding how those systems work, actually, yeah. um, because you will make yourself. Exactly. It just saves yeah. so much time, at, you know, in the long run. Totally. A bit of upfront work to begin with. No, I've always said uh, in a business, and this kind of applies to this conversation, really. I've always said success is when you make yourself redundant. And I'm sure a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? That's Not there yet. <laughs> And that's success, right? Um, yeah, the reason I think that's success is because once you have your kind of operating system, and by operating system, I don't just mean your software. I mean people, Process. sort of the modus yeah. operandi of your entire business. Once you have that functioning really well without you, you're there. You've yeah. done. You're, you're you're not the person who has to keep coming in mm -hmm. and keep checking. And I always see it, and I, I'm, I've always seen it like this from when I was much, much, much younger, is that I've always seen it like a, as if it's a dam in front of me. And there's a dam with loads and loads and loads of little holes, and there's lots of bits of water coming out from all of it. And I'm like, oh God, that one's got to be stopped. And that's, I never try and plug a single hole. I'm always looking at where's the source of the water coming from. Mm -hmm. So rather than, on the, it's very very easy on a daily basis especially in hospitality because frankly it's people coming through the door right now to buy chicken that you are cooking today 
you're going to serve those people this yeah. evening they're going to pay you're going to plan it for tomorrow and repeat mm -hmm. you know it's a very fast pace you're in the business all the time but if you can think that if you found the source of the water mm. it would probably stop let's say there might be four sources to all of these holes or maybe five sources or two sources but yeah. there certainly isn't 200 right yeah exactly so each time you find the plug, plug, find the source of the water, you will automatically plug, let's say a third or a quarter of those holes. Yeah. Now on the day when they're all squirting water at you, it's very, very hard Great image. <laughs> not to react. It's very hard not to react, right? You want to go, oh God. But realistically say to yourself, can I, can I plug 200 holes today? And the answer is definitely no, right? Yeah. So rather than focusing on those 200 holes, focus on the three or four things that are causing them at the back. Yeah. And one of them will be your financial planning, will be your software. It will be, it will cause lots of these problems. And even though to set it up, to learn it, to understand it and to find somebody to do it, it's not gonna happen today. It might take, I mean, in my experience, everything in the big sort of in like my corporate world everything takes me like 18 months basically but things like that in a smaller business let's say three to six months yeah it would take you so those holes are just drenching you on a daily basis for three to six months but at the end of the three to six months no more water amazing and, and that's how i see it's whatever i set for up anybody it. running business exactly any any business it doesn't matter how big how small I've, I've taken some notes for myself <laughs> it's so hard to make yourself redundant if you make yourself redundant imagine there's no water coming through what would you do today i mean pina what, colada oh, yeah don't know. Oh, boy like go out for lunch happy days right <laughs> nothing now you're never ever going to stop all of it of course no. you're still gonna have customers coming and you still need to feed them blah 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 but find the source of the water and that will stop the dam you know all these that will stop you getting drenched every single day. It just takes time, patience, and it takes vision and commitment. And it's very, very, very hard to ignore the firefighting today. Of course. With the belief you're going to plug the holes in the future. Yeah. I promise you, you will. Mm -hmm. And then- yeah, You need to carve out the time to, to enable yourself to do it and interrupt it as well. <laughs> okay, so hospitality, um, unless there's something that you just want to say to anyone who's listening about this next year, I think we've covered quite a lot on hospitality and I'd quite like to just move on to kind of SMEs generally and the investing side of things. Um, so as an investor, what information would you expect to always see in a plan or deck from any kind of business? Um, what so, wonderful processes should they have gone through? Yeah, I mean, Whenever I sit and look at a business as a sort of potential for investment, I kind of ask myself, firstly, you know, what are they offering? What, what product or service are they offering that, um, that people need? So, and always what else is out there? So what makes you better than something else that I can go and get at the moment? Or am I actually trying, are you actually trying to fill a new need? Is it a new product, a new innovative product, or is it a new service? Um, so what, hang on, let me get these three right. So look, <laughs> yeah, the product, yeah. what is the product? And um, then, yes, then who who is it? Who is it that you're aiming for? And why do people need them? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's who is now, once I've worked out what the product is, mm -hmm what space it fills within a market so what makes yeah. you better than anybody else i'm going to say right well then who's going to buy it yeah. so i need to understand who who wants this yeah. and how am i going to get them that's extremely important so the marketing model is really important to me because it's it's often very very much part of the business mm -hmm. how how am I going to get these customers? How are they going to know about me? Yeah. How am I going to make sure that they're going to use my new product or service? And then the third thing I look at is why are you, the entrepreneur, better placed than the person standing next to you mm -hmm. to do this business? And then I basically look at the balance between the three, but I have to have all three very, very clear in my head yeah. um, before I would consider 
any investment. So that's a really important part of the pitch to me is that those three questions yeah. are Answer. answered and to be honest the rest of it kind of falls into those categories you know you want to see commentary isn't it yeah yeah like you know do is it is this a proven concept is this well you can't really answer the first one unless it kind of is yeah um you know how what what historics have you done what potential for the future well again you can't really answer number two like who's going to buy them and how i'm going to get them without talking about your vision for the future and how you're going to get there what is your growth plan um, and then again, it's down to the experience of the team. Where are the opportunities? How are you going to make them happen? Why are you the person best suited to this? So, um, and so all of those things, that's how I, I kind of, like, whenever I do, I mean, fun, obviously I've just done a road show, right? For an IPO. So I was sat the other side of the table <laughs> doing the presentation, raising yeah. money. And I was very much, again, you know, everybody says this, but it really works. So I, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. works. You know, I start every single roadshow with, you know, thank you very much. So what's, what we're going to do today is tell you about NICAP, tell you why we're, we're best place to do it. Mm. Um, tell you about our first acquisition. This is when we're doing the roadshow before. Um, tell you why we're raising money, how much we're going to raise and what we're going to spend your money on. And then finally, why we think this is a great investment opportunity. So again, and then as I go through the whole presentation, I then go, and now we're going to tell you a bit more about the acquisition and what, you know, blah, blah, blah. And now we're going to tell you a bit more about us. Now we're going to take, and finally, we're going to re reinforce why we think this is a really good investment opportunity. So you, you're constantly hooking and everybody them on a journey. Back to yeah. the beginning yeah. Yeah. always back to what you told them you were going to tell them in the in the first place and actually as people switch off because they do um you've got to keep coming back so and now i'm going to do exactly what i said i was going to do <laughs> and now i've just done what i said i was going to do and now i'm going to do something else i said i was going to do is everybody awake you know it's like that type but you know <laughs> Brilliant, I love that. Um, so here's one that uh, we were discussing in the office, well, not in the office, in the virtual office. Uh, you know, on Dragon's Den, when everybody's got their little black books and they're doing the little, you know, as people are talking, what what calculations are you, are you, what, what are you doing? You know, and are there any specific financial calculations that you're penning? So, I penning don't, this is actually really embarrassing this, but <laughs> the, um, they really uh, went in really close on my notebook. <laughs> Uh, uh once on during the filming and i'm a terrible doodler so i draw weirdly i don't know why i draw hearts smiley faces weirdly people with sort of like curly hair big fat tummies i don't know why don't ask we could all read all kinds of things into what my doodles are and christmas trees i mean it could be worse sarah I mean, let's be honest there could have been a lot worse doodles that they could have what I do. in fact I'm sure I could find a page in my <laughs> notebook of exactly what I am talking about anyway so you expect to see such really clever intelligent stuff on those pages and they went into my notebook and all you could see was blooming Christmas trees and hearts so I was like really at least the editing stitch job. Yes. <laughs> no but the, actually um so what i do uh you do write some obviously you you're trying to work out the business i'm always trying to work out the business model that's for me it's all about the business model how much if i spent a pound what do i get back? get back what always it's all about that i'm trying to work it out so loads of notes loads of notes all based on that business model i'm trying to find something that is replicable that's yeah. that's the most important thing for me that is, is a simple replicable business model so i'm tr trying to in between everything every saying i'm trying to pull out the core business model yeah that's one thing and then also um because the way that dragon's den works you can't really interrupt so it, it, you sort of take respectfully take it in turns you know between the dragons um you might interrupt if you're aghast about something or like an, you know, oh, wow, I can't believe you said that, that type of thing. But like intelligently, you wouldn't interrupt. <laughs> so I write down my questions all the time. So as people are talking or Deborah might, Deborah might have said something to an entrepreneur that 
made me think of something like, oh, actually, I really need to know the following. I would, I always put like a little question by the side of, of down my notebook and then write my question so that I remember to come back right. to it. And it's actually still something that I do. I mean, I've yeah. just interview, interviewed somebody um, earlier this morning and as he was talking, I just kept writing questions. So I didn't interrupt him, but I kept, he made me think of things as I, as he was talking so that I would come back and ask those questions. Good. Thank you. I mean, and some, some wonderful insights onto the, the behind the scenes. Um, yeah, I know. Parts <laughs> so, of Christmas trees. Yeah, I don't know. 2021. Um, what do you think the best way to seek funding is for a small business? Now, I know this is an enormous question, but, hmm. you know, if there's anything that you've seen, you know, it, um, industry agnostic, you know, where would you, right, I've got a great idea. I think that I've hit all of those three things that you've said. I want to go for funding now. What would be, you know, your top three recommends? So firstly, I would absolutely ask myself if I really need it. You know, um, depending on what stage you're at, I, I see all too often founders that end up with no equity. You know, they've, there's literally nothing left in the business. They've gone through so many rounds of funding that they've just been diluted and diluted and diluted and diluted. Um, so, and that, I find that really disheartening. Um, so I think that's a really important question. Yeah. How, you know, we've got, so Craft Gin Club, for example, um, and I'm always, this is, as an investor, this is my thing. Mm -hmm. I am so focused on shareholder value. Um, I, and I don't like mass dilution all the time because I just want incentivized and motivated teams running the businesses. So it's really understanding how much you're likely to need mm -hmm. and understanding that could well mean significant sure. dilution as time goes on. I mean, Craft Gin Club, you know, I invested when we had 3,000 members. We've got like, I don't know, 130,000 now. Um, and the two main shareholders still own nearly 90% of the business. Wow, that is incredible. You know, it's absolutely amazing. That business, you know, turns over tens of millions a year um, and is extremely successful. But we've been so focused on, rather than going out and getting private equity funding, we did a bond. So we did a gin bond. You know, we, yeah. we've done everything we possibly can to not dilute. Yeah. So I think that's a something Thing that people don't do often enough you just automatically assume oh i need to get investment so my question is is do you really yeah. and the amount of people that have sat in front of me and i've said you're doing the wrong thing actually you, you you shouldn't be getting investment at this stage because there are other ways of doing this yes which are <laughs> oh yes there are um, i mean i'm a really big fan like if you're literally a startup and you've just come up with an idea i'm a really big fan of the likes of kickstarter where you you pre-buying effectively the first yeah you know, number of products, I think it's brilliant. Um, I mean, John and John started a craft gin club on a I mean, credit card. It's in, incredible how they did it. I'm not advocating getting a credit card out, by the way. I mean, there are startup loans as well, aren't there? Or grants, the, the very exactly. low. Yeah. yeah, I'm not so, I don't know. I'm not the best person to ask about them at all. I, I um, they're, good. they're low interest and it's per founder as well. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, great. I somebody else would know a lot more about that than me. I, it's not my area of expertise. I tend to come in a bit later now. Um, I mean, I do meet a lot of people doing startups, but I, I do tend to meet slightly bigger businesses yeah, um, at, at my stage. I mean, but, you know, bank. Yeah, you know, are you? Yeah, yeah, they were great for for. Uh, obviously we needed them to survive as well but I'm, I'm I hope that some people have taken advantage of those to be able to do sure. something with their business actually and to grow but I also think there's a difference between money and brain you know so you you do need to consider what do you actually need do you need money do you need expertise um you know when I invested in Craft Gin Club they didn't need my money it wasn't it that it wasn't they yeah. what they wanted actually was some help on the board they needed yeah. some help mm -hmm. um and they need they wanted to pick the right person to yeah. work with um for that help and had i not have been enough help we would have got somebody else in you know that, so it's it's always about why do you need it and really asking yourself are you sure that's a path that you want to go down yeah perfect very good advice um 
a little bit uh, off topic. How do you balance work and home? Because you have four lovely children. You have four uh, lovely yes. Children. How do you balance that? You're a massive advocate of, you know, getting mm. that balance right as well. Yeah. And it's not easy. Look, I, I you know, if it's probably the hardest thing. Um, Mother's guilt, huh? Yeah. It's the hardest thing I do, to be honest, is, is, is that balance. And it also depends on the stage of the kids. So mine now are 10, 11, 13 and 14. So it's, a, it's a, just a different age than they were when they were all under five, for example. Um, what I do is I prioritise my family and that really helps me um, because I feel very imbalanced when I haven't and I don't. And obviously there are times when I'm like, I actually just need to go up to London for four days. You're not going to see me for four days. Yeah. Um, and there are other times like actually the last 12 months where I've hardly been without them because, yeah. you know, we're with not them quite. all the time. All and the time. now you really want to go to London. And now I can't wait to go to London. <laughs> I just can't wait. But interestingly enough, because I believe in balance and I feel balance, um, I, I don't feel bad about that because... No. I've been around so much so and I think you know some people I've got friends that um their priority absolutely is their work so that's what they prioritize and I think the most important thing I think for anybody is to under I sincerely believe you can't fight nature you know nature is will always win always you can try and do all kinds of things but it is I I think it's a given fact that nature is going to win so don't try and go against nature. So if you are somebody that needs to work, go and work. Your family, it will, it will, you will find yeah. the balance with your family. Yeah. If you're somebody that needs to be a mom, make sure you are doing something that allows you to be a mom. Because if you're not, you you're will, yeah. you, you, it, nature will win always. Um, and that's definitely something that I've learned over the years is to be very much in tune with that and to say, mm -hmm. you know what? I actually need to be Sarah Willingham at the moment, which is me, you know, my maiden name, me without kids. It's like Sarah Willingham, who I am at my core. I need to go out and work and feel clever about stuff. And, yeah. in, you know, just um, be, be who I kind of was 15 years ago or whatever. And then at other times, I'm like, I need to bed in, I need to cook, I need to bake, I need to fill my table with food, stick all my kids around it. Um, you know, I need to plan a holiday. Yeah. It is oh, about, okay. <laughs> it's just about finding exactly. your balance. balance exactly. your but, balance. but actively working that, that out for yourself. Well, and, and also don't let things go because um, I think if you're going against nature for a long period of time, you'll really pay for that. So if you feel yourself out of tune, even in one week, act on it. Don't mm. let that fester. Don't let that go on. Great words. But, yeah, you, it only gets deeper and deeper and deeper and it just becomes a mess. Yeah. So actually learn the signs and act on them very quickly. Amazing. Now I'm going to ask one question. If there are any questions that you all have, attendees, please put them either in the chat or the Q&A. We've got six already, actually. We'll just go straight to these. Um, so put my glasses on because I'm totally blind. Uh, would you consider opening a new build restaurant now in this economic environment? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I'm so. very bullish. Look, I think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I am. So opening yeah, exactly. So yes, uh, definitely I, I would. But, you know, I... I also know what I'm doing and that, if that makes sense, I've opened loads and loads of restaurants and I know, um, I, know time, yeah. I know what makes it work. Now, if it's the first time you're doing it, I, I think it's a very good economic environment for having a restaurant. I really do. I think hospitality. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I mean, what a thumbs up. Right? Yeah. I think hospitality is going to have a great year. Um, just make sure you've got your, you know, those margins that we talked about, just make sure that you keep it simple yeah. um, and you know what you're doing and don't take on huge overheads because if this happens again, you're stuck with a really high cash burn. Yeah, which is painful as I yeah. know. 
Um, okay. What, uh, what operational model changes are needed to take the opportunity in the market? For example, deliveries or cloud kitchens? What are your, what are your thoughts on those, the diversification that's, that's um, do you think everyone should be doing it or just really look at your own supply and demand? Yeah, it's a good question. So yes, actually I didn't say that earlier, did I? But of course, whoever asked that question is absolutely right. Delivery is a huge, yeah. huge change to hospitality. The at-home model is incredible. And you've got the businesses that are doing these like restaurant kits, kits and dish patch, which I just think have completely revolutionize the country's Friday night when they properly grow to mass market. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think that demand, the at-home demand, despite yeah. the fact that we can go out, I think it's not that we're going to do things at home more than we did before. I think we're more discerning at home. And I think that's the difference. So we are going to demand um, restaurant yeah. quality food. And, you know, for the majority of the country don't have Just Eat or Deliveroo close by. They might just have one Indian takeaway that can deliver to them. They're not all, you know, I live in central Brighton, which we're, we're very, very lucky. Um, but not not everybody does right no, quite. Um, so this I think what ha what's happened a lot in lockdown is your local pub that you always had to go to um will all, was also doing at home food and I think yeah. that's very likely to stay with a lot of people where you can still have that quality food but you can choose to have it at home if you want to and I think that'll be an extra revenue stream for a lot of hospitality businesses which is brilliant and also the digitalization of their their businesses as well as you know has been a knock-on effect of that with some um Patrick wants to know, hello, Patrick, Patrick Levy, one of our lovely customers, what sort of numbers in the management accounts are of most use? Activity numbers that inform the P&L or is the P&L level enough? Um, so actually, there is some stuff on the P&L that I think you don't need. So it's more like the other way around. Um, you need you need numbers that can be controlled by people mm -hmm. on your management accounts. I think it's probably one of the best ways of of saying it so you need your sales I would want to understand my sales mix and is that um, by shift as well so lunchtime dinner you know splitting yeah, them out yeah, yeah. and you would and I would always be looking to adjust my menu accordingly so you know one of the things that most people a lot of people think that the way that you can really impact your cost of sales is by um changing your purchasing what you're buying in actually the best and easiest way to impact your cost of sales is your menu yeah um and looking at how you uh you know your sales mix when i had the bombay bicycle club everybody bought rice obviously um and the margin on rice margin yeah absolutely massive mm -hmm. um so it really balanced out my um i was able to manage my business because i understood from my management accounts and, oh, I understand, and understand my sales mix that actually 70 whatever percent of people were buying chicken tikka masala was called something else but chicken tikka masala and rice mm -hmm. so it's like well frankly if i just move the needle on the chicken tikka masala i heavily impact my um mm -hmm. p l whereas frankly there's not really much point me doing anything about the prawn dish because only three people bought it last week. Sure. Or you know, so yeah. it's, it's understanding that that I think is really important. So it's stuff that you can manage and that you can change. Customer uh, numbers, of course, as well. I would, would say they'd be a non-financial uh, data point, would they? And are you looking at average spend per head? Are you looking at that? And if I can, you know, if I can up train my sales team, sorry, sales team, you know, front yeah, of house. Yeah, yeah, front of house. You know, yeah. Vacant to upsell, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, looking at your average spend per head is great, but the mix within that is also sure. important because that obviously impacts your cash at yeah. the end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you can get more out of each table per hour, happy days, you know, so it's those types of things where that form part, they, they tend to be pulled out of your management accounts mm -hmm. and have as sort of your key performance indicators, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. It's all about things that you can control. control. Exactly. Control. And we have gone, well, we're, we were a bit late because of me, um, but we're, we're at time. Um, so just, just want to say thanks. I mean, I found it utterly fascinating and have learned some things that I'm going to take away as well. I'm going to have a big dam in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right for everybody. That technology. It's not right for everyone. People might <laughs> I'm like, yep, yeah, recognize that story. <laughs>
<laughs> um, Sarah, you're just a superstar. Thank you so much for taking the time. And hopefully everybody's really enjoyed, um, you know, everything that you've had to share. It will be recorded. Um, we'll do a transcript of it as well. And we'll send the link out to everyone who's registered. Um, so here we go. It's been brilliant. Comments are already coming in. Um, you're a superstar. Thank you. Well, I'm so pleased. Oh, I'm really glad you enjoyed it anytime. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Good luck. Anyone out there that's got business, good luck. And all the best for the summer. Um, like I say, just don't leave a pound on the table. No. And for those small businesses and some accountants, we've got, we have a, a, a bit of a coup has happened where if any of you would like our predict plug and play kind of instant forecasting software for free for an entire year, um, we have, we've been, we've partnered with Iwaka, uh, Iwaka Pay, which is a new product. Um, which is a bit like Klarna for business. Uh, so an option to get paid up front. So just get paid without any uh, interest costs, but your customers can pay later, which will mean that you'll probably win more business. This is not necessarily hospitality, but you know, if there are other small businesses and accountants um, and all they need to do is register their zero to I walk a pain, you get predict free for a whole year. So we're really looking at getting you paid and helping your cash flow impact and then seeing the impact and predict and being able to run your business, you know, grow your business, sleep more, retire earlier, because um, you won't do that without a forecast. Uh, so um, so yes, yeah, so if anybody is interested in this, please email Helen, that's not me, Helen at futurely.com and um, she will sort you out. Thanks everyone. Brilliant. Thanks a bye. lot. Bye. 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 Bye.